I'm currently on a cruise and I'm staying in a balcony cabin that has a quirky downside that I've never had on a cruise before. The cruise lines don't advertise cabins like this and most people have no idea that they exist. I found this cabin almost by accident and I booked it because of the discount price. This cruise has taken us from Singapore to Tokyo and for me it has been a real bucket list adventure. Like most bucket list things though, it has not been cheap and when booking I knew that flights from the UK would likely cost more than the actual cruise. With that in mind, I really didn't want to spend more than I had to on the cabin but I also didn't want to miss out on anything as I'd come halfway around the world to be here. I didn't want to book an inside cabin and miss out on seeing something incredible but I also didn't want to pay full price for a balcony cabin which was almost double the price of an inside cabin. This was already the most expensive trip that I'd ever planned. I decided to compromise and to book something new and I booked a obstructed view cabin. I hoped that I wouldn't regret it. There have been both negatives and positives that I hadn't considered before the cruise, even though I thought I was well prepared. To save a little more money, I booked what is called a guaranteed cabin. That meant that I didn't pick my specific location and that I could be given a cabin anywhere on the ship. More importantly for me, that meant that I could be given a cabin with any level of obstruction. I could have a tiny thing obstructing the bottom corner of my view, or I could be facing a lifeboat head on with no view of the ocean at all. The lifeboats usually are a lovely colour, but that didn't mean that I wanted to stare at one for 12 days straight. A couple of months before the cruise, my cabin was assigned, and when the email popped up, I was very, very excited. I was a little nervous though, because I hoped that I had made the right decision. I rushed to Royal Caribbean's website and there I found my cabin 6182 at the front of deck 6. That cabin and the ship that I'm currently on is Spectrum of the Seas built in 2019. The cabin was close to the stairs which looked good so I moved on to looking at the deck plans above and below to see if there was anything that might be noisy around us. I saw that we were directly over the music hall and for some reason I had a sixth sense that at some point they may play music in the music hall. I had no idea how long it would go on for or if we would be able to hear it but I hoped that it wouldn't keep us awake during the cruise because we had a very busy cruise planned with lots of excursions. We were also very close to the theatre and I hoped that we wouldn't hear any of the shows although to be honest I had no idea what type of shows they would have on an American cruise ship designed for the Chinese market cruising out of Singapore. All of the documents that I had about the cabin said that it was 50% obstructed but that could have meant anything. I didn't know if that was 50% obstructed when standing up, 50% when sat down, 50% to the left, to the right, above, below, I had no idea. I assumed that it would be a lifeboat blocking the view because I couldn't really imagine anything else above the promenade deck but it could have been any machinery, it could have been metal. There are some interesting things on the ship, so in theory, I could have been obstructed by a skydiving simulator, a surf simulator, a giant panda, almost anything. Embarkation was a little more complicated than usual, thanks to all of the nationalities and the visas, but it was fairly fast and fairly easy. Our cabin was ready from 1.30 and I honestly think we arrived at the cabin at about 2 seconds past 1.30. I couldn't wait to drop off my bag, charge my phone, use the toilet and importantly check out the view or lack of. On what is called turnaround day, the cruise ship disembarks all the guests and replaces them with new ones. So it's incredible how they managed to clean and tidy all of the cabins by half past one. Walking into the cabin, I was happy to see that the design was actually the same as a cabin I had on board Anthem of the Seas, which I cruised on last year. We loved that cabin, so I hoped that this would be the same. But on Anthem, we did have glorious, unobstructed views of Norway. I was instantly drawn to all the paperwork on the desk and it would turn out that we would need a lot of paperwork on this cruise. In almost every port, we needed some sort of customs forms or landing cards. It was a lot, but so worth it. There's a big sofa here to the side too, which is where I'm sitting, and on the other side there's a desk, there's lots of drawers, there's a mirror, and there's a lamp. I put my phone on charge at one of the US sockets and I noticed that we had a kettle. It's very rare to find a kettle on a Royal Caribbean cruise, so I thought that that was good, but I actually never used this throughout the entire cruise because it has been just so hot. I even had ice in my drinks on this cruise, and normally I never do that. I honestly forgot about the obstruction for a minute, I was just so relieved when I got into this cabin to finally be here and to be in Singapore. I looked up and I just thought to myself, oh yeah, what is that? Following the cabin around the big bed, I went to have a look outside. As soon as I opened up the door, my glasses and everything inside the cabin instantly steamed up. It was very, very humid on this cruise, but I would use that to my benefit later. It's hard to describe the humidity of the places we visited like Vietnam. I've never known anything like it in my life. It's safe to say that we were very reliant on the air conditioning during this cruise, and it worked very well, thankfully. The balcony itself was a good size with two chairs and a table, but I of course was more interested in the view. 
Looking out, I could see the top half of a lifeboat. I mean, of course I could. It is bright yellow. It's not hard to see. But what I was more interested in was looking down and looking to the sides to get my bearings. The deck below us was the promenade deck and the lifeboats were hanging in between. To the sides were more cabins with a similar view and the cabins above us, they had a completely clear view. The cabins to the side I think had a worse view than us because they had some of these white metal parts that lower the lifeboats up and down. I'm not sure if they paid less or more than me, but I was very happy with my view, given that I was just randomly assigned this cabin. At the time of booking this cruise, it would have cost £300 for the two of us to have moved one deck up, and at this point I thought there's no way that I would pay that, but I still hadn't discovered any of the downsides of this cabin. I wondered how it would be out here at night and what it would be like during the sail-ins and the sail-outs. I was also a little bit worried about the noise of the lifeboats being put up and down, they do use these lifeboats as tenders and of course they have to test them pretty regularly. Only time would tell though and I would notice the first downside of this cabin later this evening. Coming back into the cabin I headed to the bathroom and found that it had most things on my ideal cruise ship bathroom checklist. There was lots of storage, there was a shower door, the shower didn't leak, it had the bonus mystery step in it, a nightlight and a toilet that flushes through suction. When a cruise ship toilet flushes, it goes down into a water treatment plant, it goes through a couple of very clever processes and then it is released into the sea. At that point, apparently it is clean enough to drink, but uh, I, I don't want to do that. The only downside with this bathroom, which I would find out about later, was that the tap water never really got cold. It was pretty much the options of hot or warm. I do use the water in the tap to make squash. I've got some here that I made in what was originally a Japanese grape drink. I don't know what this says, I can't read Japanese, but it was very, very tasty. It wasn't too much of a big deal though, it just meant that I'd have to put the water into the fridge to kind of take off that warm feeling. The fridge is located down by the desk with these five big drawers. They're all beautiful, soft closing doors too, which made me happy every single time I closed them. And there are a couple of extra drawers under the wardrobe on the other side. As well as these two hanging sections, there's actually more storage up high, so we definitely didn't struggle to find space to put things away. There were some extra towels and pillows up here too, which was good because the towels were pretty tiny. I could just about cover up everything that I needed to, but if anybody is any taller or bigger than me, it would be a good shout to get the pool towels, which are much bigger from the pool, and to just use them in your room. Make sure you give it back by the end of the cruise though, or they will charge you $25 for it. Your Britishism of the week is the phrase good shout. Good shout is just a good idea or a good suggestion. And it's normally said in response to somebody. For example, if someone says, Emma, do you want to stop off and get some cookies on the way back to the cabin? I'll say, that's a good shout. Apparently, this Britishism has made it over the pond a little bit. So let me know if you do say that. It all looked great in this cabin, but it wasn't until our first night and then our first port of call when we really got to see how the cabin worked in reality. It is a seven hour time difference between London and Singapore, plus a 13 hour flight. So it's safe to say that I was feeling pretty jet lagged and I did sleep a lot on this cruise not always at the right times of day. When trying to go to sleep, I noticed that we could hear music. It was quite faint, but it definitely was the bass line. I can sleep through most things, so it was totally fine, but most nights the music would go on until around 2am. Some days it actually started at 2am, so if you are someone who's a light sleeper, don't book a cabin that's directly above a club. Hopefully that goes without saying. The beds were very comfortable, and there were US sockets by the side with a little bit of storage. I often sat out on the balcony in the evenings when the temperature had dropped and it was a great space for that. I couldn't really see much when I was sat down. If we were sailing in or out of the port, we would usually be up on the top deck anyway. If I was on the balcony, I would just stand up. It wasn't that difficult. We had the most incredible drone shown put on for us by one of the Japanese ports. And when things like that happened, we would just go up to the top deck. I wouldn't try and see it from here. One thing that I didn't expect pre-cruise was that the promenade deck would be lit up at night. It does make sense as guests can wander around any time and the crew were often cleaning or maintaining it. What that meant though was that the light would come in and it would always get around the curtains. Again, not a problem for me at all, but I do know some people who need it to be completely dark to sleep and you're never going to get that in this cabin. Some of the cabins do have the sofa and the bed switch, so this area would be the bed and the sofa would be by the balcony. That may be better in this situation. We didn't use the sofa very much during our cruise because it was pretty occupied by the friends of our channel mascot Captain Hudson here. I should point out it is absolutely not normal to get this many towel animals, but Captain Captain Hudson was recognized and it was decided that he needed some friends so that is why I'm filming this on the floor. One day of this cruise I woke up, I opened my curtains, I was looking at the view and I was thinking wow 
That looks lovely. It took me a while to realise that I could see so clearly because the lifeboat was gone. I never heard it go, but the lifeboat was gone. Don't worry, it hadn't fallen off during the night. We were in Vietnam. It is a tender port, which means that the ship uses the lifeboats to get everybody to land. When our obstruction was there, it was a little bit tricky to take photos of the ports without the lifeboat being in them. For me, for my channel and my website, I think I took more photos of the lifeboat than anything else. And honestly, I think I know this lifeboat inside and out by now. I could see inside actually too, which was pretty cool. I was always half expecting to see somebody in there. I don't know why they would be, it doesn't make any sense, but I was always looking. It was nice to have this extra view for the day, but I certainly wouldn't want to pay the extra price for it. It was fine. One of the main reasons I like having a balcony cabin is that I can feel what the weather's like so I know what to wear, and also so I can dry my clothes outside if I do wash any. That was another benefit of this cabin, and it absolutely did it perfectly. The sun came on, I could still sunbathe, I could do everything that I would do in a normal balcony cabin, apart from maybe look straight down at the sea. A benefit of that though is because I cannot look straight down at the sea, nobody who's down there can look straight back up at me. No one can see that I'm drying my socks up here, apart from the fact that I'm putting this on the internet. It isn't just lifeboats that can be between balcony cabins and the ocean. I recently took a cruise where the promenade deck was at the end of my cabin, the real promenade deck where people are wandering around. To find out what that was like and why this cabin cost more than a standard balcony, not less, it cost more, check out this video next.